Uh, hello and welcome. Uh, we've been studying vector spaces, linear maps, a lot of abstract things in this course. And in case you're feeling very worried about any possible application that's going to come or not, uh, this lecture hopefully will solve some of those concerns. Uh, in this lecture, we will start looking at solving linear equations. So now linear equations show up so many, so often in engineering and practice and other applications, it's very, very important to know how to solve them, particularly large set of linear equations. When you have, uh, you know, thousands of variables and thousands of equations, how do you go about solving them systematically, uh, etc. is very important. So this lecture, we will put to use all that we have learnt about vector spaces, linear maps and their associated properties to see how to go about uh, solving linear equations and you'll see uh, the the important ideas that we saw in the previous lectures about injectivity, surjectivity, invertibility of linear maps will play an important role in being able to quickly solve uh, linear equations uh, you know, you know, in, in a nice way. Okay, so let's proceed. So a quick recap, once again, we always start with a recap. Uh, we, we all know these vector spaces over a particular scalar field f, the f is usually real or complex and in this course at least. Uh, we have studied linear maps. Uh, from one vector space to the other, which preserves linear combinations. We looked at the null space, we looked at the range space, etc. And this one, there's this wonderful result called the fundamental theorem of linear maps, uh, which says, uh, relates the dimension of the null and the range to the dimension of the overall uh, initial vector space V. And then we saw this interesting correspondence between M cross N matrices over uh, uh, you know, uh, the field F and a linear map from Fn to Fm. And this, we also saw these isomorphisms which, uh, you know, uh, made this connection much stronger. Uh, in particular, there's this notion of column space, which is the same as the range of the linear map, this notion of null space of a matrix, which is also the same as the null space for the uh, linear map, okay. And we also saw invertible operators and we saw that they define isomorphisms, things that are the same. And then we saw these powerful isomorphisms that any finite dimensional vector space is like f power n and uh, in linear maps are in fact isomorphic to matrices. All of these results uh, we saw before, now we will put quite a few of these results to use in trying to solve linear equations. So what is a linear equation? It is it's given right here, it is Ax equals b. Many of you probably have already seen it before, it is worth emphasizing once again. We will in general keep A as an m cross n matrix. Uh, from the scalar field F, okay, each element A i j is like that and, and I will denote the general element as small a i j. So that is the i row and j th column, that is the, that's the element A i j. The vector x, we will generally think of it as a column vector but I want, when I want to write it compactly, I will write it as a row with the commas. So hopefully that is clear enough to you, I have done it quite a few times so far. So x is a vector from of length n, right, x1 through xn and B is a vector of length M, okay. So this matrix A takes an input from Fn and puts out an output of Fm, right, after multiplication by the vector on the right. So Ax equals B. So what, what is given usually in a linear equation? A is given, the matrix A is given, X is unknown, you have to find X and then B is given, okay. So you have to find X, you have to solve for X such that A times X becomes equal to B, okay. So simple enough. Uh, to state, it shows up in so many applications. I mentioned quite a few of them. Those of you in electrical engineering would have seen that to solve linear circuits, you need to use uh, linear equations and so many other applications today in the world. Uh, they use linear equations. This is bread and butter. Without this, you can't really, uh, you know, implement many things today. Okay, so now that we know this connection between linear maps and uh, matrices, what is the interpretation in terms of linear maps, okay? So you have a linear equation here. So how would you think about it in terms of linear maps and, uh, you know, use maybe some of the properties of linear maps to help solve your equation. So is that possible, okay? So we know that this matrix A, uh, once I think of the standard basis, so see, when, when somebody gives you a linear equation, nobody's going to mention basis or anything. So you just assume standard basis, right? So you take the standard basis and uh, let A represent a linear map T in the standard basis. Okay, that is easy enough for us to do, right? So how do you do this? Uh, we have this uh, vectors in the standard basis. I will use this notation for vectors in the standard basis. Uh, you can see that notation here. So this is uh, the jth vector in the standard basis for length n, 
right. So, E, J, N. So, so this sort of captures everything. Uh, quite often this N will be clear. So, if this N is clear, I will simply say E, J, okay. But if it is not clear, I will put in this case. So, in this case, you can have both N and M. So, it is a bit confusing. So, we put the N uh, explicitly uh, in this uh, uh, in, in this notation, okay. So, hopefully that is clear. So, that is uh, the the standard basis vector which has 1 at the jth position, 0 everywhere else, right. So, that is what uh, that is what the standard basis, uh, basis means. Uh, and then uh, how do we do this matrix to linear map correspondence? We simply say that T acting on E j, okay, when the ma linear map T acts on E j, its output is the jth column of A, okay. So, this is sort of consistent with the matrix vector product and that is exactly what we mean. Okay, so, we have seen this already before. So, there is this linear map T uh, which is associated with uh, the matrix A, okay. So, in terms of the linear map, we are also asking a specific question here when you solve a linear equation, right. So, you are given a W which belongs to the capital W vector space which is nothing but your coordinate vector B1, B2 to Bm, right. So, you pick the standard basis for uh, W also and so W one can write in terms of what it is, right. So, B1 E1 plus B M E M with length M, right. So, that is W. You have to find a V whose coordinates are X1 through Xn, okay. Find all V, I guess, not just one V, you want to solve it entirely maybe, right. So, that is one ambition you may have. So, such that T times V equals W. So, if, if you like drawing pictures here, yeah, we have been drawing pictures to represent linear maps quite a bit. So, if, if you draw this uh, picture here, let us say you want to denote this as V and you want to denote this as W and somebody gives you a W here, somebody defines a map T from V to W, you need to see if there is a V that will take you to W or maybe you know a set which entirely takes you to W, okay. So, this is your question. Okay, so this is your solution. So this, uh, this entire set. There may be multiple vectors that take you to the same W, right? So it's not uh, every linear map is not one to one, right? The non one to one linear maps. So you may have multiple inputs taking you to the same output W. We already know that. So in that case, one needs to find out all those uh, inputs. That that is the goal of solving a linear equation. So we see that there is this nice correspondence. So quite often when somebody gives you a matrix, maybe you have to think about the linear map associated with the matrix. What kind of properties does it have? Can I guess some properties of that linear map? From that, what, what can I infer about the solutions to the linear equation, okay? So, those are interesting ideas. We will explore some of that in this lecture, okay? Uh, there is one particular case which is very important and interesting and it forms a subcase of the problem. Uh, supposing your B is 0, okay, or W is 0, okay? So, in the previous uh, slide, I drew that picture. And supposing W is 0, in that case, the solution to that equation Ax equals 0 is basically the null set, right? the null space, I'm sorry, okay. So, the null T is given by set of all x such that Ax equals 0, okay. So, the null T is also a solution to this linear equation, okay. So, so you see this nice little uh, interesting connection here. And the fact that uh, this null plays an important role, uh, you will see even when B is not 0, uh, null will play an important role. You will see how it enters the picture here. So, this null of this linear map T is very crucial to understand, okay. So, it determines a lot of properties of the linear map we have seen before. Uh, null space is connected to injectivity, right. If null is just the 0, then the map is uh, 1 to 1. If it is non-zero, then it is not 1 to 1, okay. So, likewise range of T is also very important, okay. Range of T may be, it looks like it does not show up explicitly. We will see later on how it will show up. For instance, you can you can see that, you know, the B needs to be in the range of T, right. So, if you, if you, if you pick a B which is not, a pick a W which is not in the range of T, then no V is going to take you there, okay. So, null of T and range of T, you can see already they are going to play an important role and uh, understanding what they are and uh, whether the map is injective or surjective will play a crucial role in the solution. So, let us start looking at some such equations and see how to figure out things about the solution. So, we will do mostly by example, I will pick some simple examples and then work through them and then I will present the general case and how to go about solving a general case, okay. 
So here is a very simple example, you have uh, Ax equals b, it is a 3 cross 3 example. I have picked the A in a specific simple way, I have picked it in a sort of, sort of a triangular way, you can see that there are lots of zeros there in a critical place. Uh, so maybe it looks less general to you, but later on we will see how this is good enough. Okay? So now when you look at a, a matrix like this, you have to start thinking about the linear map associated with this matrix and see if you can say anything about it. So the first thing you observe is the linear map associated with this matrix works as follows, right? It is going to take the input 1 0 0 to the output 1 0 0. It is going to take the input 0 1 0 to the output 2 4 0, okay? That is the second column, isn't it? 2 4 0. It is going to take the input 0 0 1 to 3 5 6, that is the third column, right? So that is how this linear map works, isn't it? So that is a very easy description to see. Now, what is the range of this linear map? We already saw that the range is important, right? So, B needs to be in the range, otherwise there is no hope of a solution, okay? So, range of this linear map is simply span of the columns, we know that. So, 1, 0, 0, 2, 4, 0, 3, 5, 6. If you work it out, you see that these are linearly independent. It is easy to see that they are linearly independent, right? And R3, you are in R3 and you have three linearly independent vectors, that is a spanning set, isn't it? So, you span the whole thing. So, the span of the range of T becomes R3. Now, once range becomes R3, you know null is going to be just 0, isn't it? So, that is because, uh, you know, you have the fundamental theorem. So, 3 has to be equal to 3 plus something. So, and that something is going to become 0, okay? So, the dimension of null t is going to go to 0. Even otherwise, maybe you can conclude null is 0. So, uh, null is uh, 0. So, now you see that the map t is both injective and surjective, okay? So, in specifically, t becomes an invertible map. Okay. So, just from the matrix A, I am able to look at the linear map corresponding to it and look at the structure of the matrix A, make some statements about the range, make some statements about the null and then infer that T is invertible. So, once I know T is invertible, I can make a statement about the solution. Why is that? I know that there will be a unique solution for every B. Why is that? Let us just think about what an invertible matrix means. Okay, so, an invertible operator takes V to W, it is 1 to 1 and on to, right? So, it is almost like every point here goes to some unique point there, right? So, that is how an invertible map looks. You know, I, I probably will not be able to draw every single point on the vector space. You can imagine what I am trying to get to, right? So, this is what 1 to 1 uh, invertible T does, okay? So, every point in V gets mapped to a unique point in W, okay? So, no matter what B I give you, no matter what W I give you, there will be an X which is uniquely being brought from V to W by T, right? So, that is the invertible map. So, I know for sure that there will be a unique solution for every B. So, that is the statement I can make about a linear equation with this matrix A. Okay, why? Because the linear map associated with it is an invertible map. Okay? So, that is a nice statement we made. So, notice what we were able to do. We were able to look at the matrix, info properties about the linear map, info property to properties about, uh, you know, how the linear map works and then, you know, we are able to make statements about the solution without, uh, you know, worrying too much. And there are, maybe you knew these answers before, but maybe this is a different way to view it and this can give you, uh, you know, more, more insight into what is going on. Okay, so, that is a simple example. So, let us start complicating the examples a little bit more and look at other types of linear maps, but we will keep them, you know, sort of upper triangular to make our work easy. Here is another example. Here is another matrix. It is a 3 by 5 matrix, okay. It takes length 5 vectors to length 3 vectors, all right. And the matrix is uh, given to you there. You see the numbers 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, just pick them. In, uh, in some way, you can put other numbers if you like. What is important is the diagonal uh, sort of uh, structure there, the upper triangular structure, okay? So, you have zeros in the critical place. So, from there, you can quickly infer the range of T. You saw the range plays an important role. The range of T is R3, right? So, if you look at it, I mean, similar to the previous argument, you have three linearly independent vectors in the column. So, that will span the entire R3. So, the range of T is R3. From the fundamental theorem, once again, we can quickly infer that the null space is non-trivial. So, the dimension of null of t is going to be 2 
and uh, we don't know yet how to find the null space. Towards the end of this week, you will you will see uh, clear methods to find the diamond, the actual null space itself. But this information is enough to us. Just by looking at this matrix, I know that the range is the entire R three. The null has dimension two, so I'm able to infer that my map T, represented by this matrix A, is surjective, but it's not injective. Okay, so it's not one to one. The null space is not trivial, but it is surjective. The range occupies the entire W, right? So that's nice to know. So once you have a T which is surjective and not injective, we know a lot of properties about how the map looks, right? So there is a null space, but it's surjective. Okay, so you can see that there will be infinitely many solutions for every B. Okay, so we'll I'll, I'll be very precise and clear about it uh, later on, but you can see why this should be true, right? Surjective means every point in W, maybe I should draw this picture once again. Surjective already means, so I have a V which is maybe much bigger and a W which is slightly smaller in this particular case. Uh, since the map is surjective, what does it mean? So surjective means any W I pick here, there is at least one V such that T takes you to W, right? So that's what surjective means, okay? So every W here, there is something on V that will come here, that's true. But why do I say infinitely many solutions? Once I know that there is one solution, I can make many more solutions from it, okay? So we'll see precisely why this is so later on. But once you have one solution, you can sort of add the null to it and you'll get infinitely many solutions, okay? So at least you can see that there should be one solution for every B. That much is maybe easy to for you to see. Maybe you don't quite see where the infinitely many comes from. Later on, I'll tell you exactly why it is. And you can also imagine why this should be true, right? So from surjectivity, we know that there exists at least one V such that TV equals W. Now, I know my null space is non-trivial, right? So if you take any X, any U, Okay, so you take any u in null t and if you look at v plus u, what will happen if I hit t with v plus u? So you pick any u in null t and then you look at t of v plus u. You know, t v is w. What is t u? u is in the null space, so t u is 0, so you, this also becomes w. Okay, so if you have at least one v, which is guaranteed by the surjectivity. And if you have a null space which is big, which is non-trivial, then you will have infinitely many solutions because you can take any one solution and keep adding the null space to it, null space vectors to it, and you will still retain the same property here, okay? So this whole thing is actually V plus, I can do a shortcut and write it as V plus null t, okay? So what is V plus null t? V plus every vector in the null space T. All of those are solutions. So that's why you have this infinitely many solutions, okay? So just the surjectivity and not being injective definitely guarantees you'll have infinitely many solutions for every B, okay? So that's a nice property for you to know, okay? So let's look at other cases. We've seen two cases now. One was a three by three case, which was invertible. Here is a three by five case, which was surjective, but not injective. You can have so many more combinations, right? Let's see what happens in the other two possible combinations, okay? So here's an example. There's a matrix A once again, but I've made a change here. I've made the last row fully zero. It's still a three by three case. But what happens here is, if you look at the range of T, it's only dimension two, okay? The reason is the last row is zero. You can never get anything non-zero in the last coordinate, right? So you will never hit the Z axis, so to speak. You'll only have the first two values and the range is two. Uh, when the dimension of the range is 2, when the dimension of the range is 2, the dimension of null becomes 1, okay? So now here we have a question, uh, a, li a linear map, which is not surjective, okay? Why? Because the range is not the entire space. It's not injective also, okay? So the null is non-trivial, okay? So it's not surjective, which means for every B, I'm not guaranteed a solution, right? Because I may be outside the range. If I'm outside the range, I will not have a solution, okay? So, but if you're inside the range, I will definitely have at least one solution and by our previous logic, I can add the null space to all the solutions, any solution I have, so I will have infinitely many solutions, okay? So that's what will happen in this case and I've written it down below. 
if you have a B1, B2, B3 in the range of T, then you will have infinitely many solution. In this particular example, it is easy to write down a condition to check whether or not uh, this B is in the range of T, right. So, B3 has to be 0. If B3 is 0, then you know that B1, B2, B3 is in the range of T and then, uh, you know, you will have infinitely many solutions. Once again, infinitely many because it is not injective, okay. And if you are in the range, then you have infinitely sol many solutions. But if you are not in the range, you will have no solution, okay. So, that is the sort of picture uh, to keep in mind. Once again, let us draw pictures here. You, if you have a V and if you have a W and uh, this is your range of T, okay. And uh, if your B is in here, this corresponds to this particular case. If your B is here, this corresponds to this case. Okay, once again, why is that true? There is a V, there is at least one V because it is in the range, there is at least one V and then you do V plus null T to get your uh, infinitely many solutions. Okay, so hopefully that was clear to you. So you see that the properties of the linear map start affecting the nature of the solution, what can happen, what cannot happen. As long as the map was surjective, we know that for any B there is a solution. Once it becomes not surjective, you have to worry about whether a solution will be there or not. It depends on whether B is in the range or not, okay. And then whether it is injective or not controls how many solutions you have. If it is injective, then you have only one solution. If it is not injective, if there is a non-trivial null space, then you will have infinitely many solutions, okay. So that is the nice uh, sort of, you know, uh, classification of the type of solutions, okay. So there is one more case we missed out and that is uh, given here in this picture. It is sort of a tall matrix, you see once again zeros all over the place, uh, but this particular matrix has this uh, nice little structure. If you think about it, uh, the dimension of the range is only 3, right. So there are only 3 vectors, uh, you cannot go more than 3, but then the space is W is 4 dimension, okay. So the range of di has dimension only 3, so it is not surjective, uh, but the null space is 0, right. So once the uh, dimension of the range becomes 3, you use your fundamental theorem, you get null space of dimension 0. So, it is injective, it is not surjective, but injective, okay. So, that is sort of a linear map, uh, this one is, if you have not surjective, but injective, this is what will happen, okay. You will have a unique solution if B is in the range, right. So, it is injective, but it is not surjective. So, if B is inside the range, you will have a unique solution. And uh, in this particular case, maybe it is not very obvious to you, or maybe you can think about it. There is again a condition which you can state in terms of uh, B3 and B4 to check whether B1, B2, B3, B4 is in the range or not and that is just uh, that's what I have put there. Uh, but generally basically B1, B2, B3, B4 has to be in the range for there to be a unique solution. If they are not in the range, there will be no solution to this uh, particular problem, okay. So hopefully these four examples uh, gave you a nice feel for how to think of a linear, a linear equation, look at the matrix, look at the associated uh, linear map corresponding to that matrix, figure out its properties, see if it is injective, see if it is surjective and then make some statements about what type of solution you will have. Notice I did not do any solving, right, so I, I do not even know what the values of B are, right. So based on just the properties of the matrix, I am able to infer what kind of solutions I can anticipate, okay, and then given a B, I will be able to come up with some sort of an answer, right. So that is the, uh, that is hopefully it gave you the example. Uh, but then you should now ask me this question, I always pick these convenient examples with a lot of zeros where these linear independence was easy to see, I could easily see the dimension of the range, right. You could just eyeball the dimension of the range looking at the zeros and you could use fundamental theorem to find the dimension of the null. So you knew whether it was injective or surjective and then you could do that. What if your matrix was not like that? What if your matrix had non-zero elements everywhere, all over the place, a random, maybe zero here, but nothing useful for you to figure out linear dependence or independence. What do you do in that case? It turns out, if you look, for instance, at the general 3 by 3 case, okay. So I can also look at a general bigger case, but you know, general 3 by 3 is good enough for you to get a feel for what can happen. It turns out, you can do Gaussian eliminations through these elementary row operations, at least in this course, I will think about elementary row operations in some sense and get it to a form which looks like that, okay. You just by elementary row operation, you can make sure you have a lower triangular sort of form, okay. So you have this diagonal and then zeros below that and once you have that, you are back to your familiar territory, right. So, so far these four examples that I gave cover this lower triangular form 
and you can make inferences about surjectivity, injectivity and all that. Okay. So, in the next lecture, we will talk about elementary row operations, uh, but before we go there, uh, there is a little quiz I have prepared for you. It will be useful for me if you can go through the quiz and uh, pick some answers and it will give me feedback on what you have understood and how things are. Okay. Thank you very much.